Be seated, and if there's any kids who will join me up here. Remember that Jesus' explanation of the story says that at the harvest time, the Son of Man will send his reapers, the angels. I think the church often sees itself in the role of the reaper, the one who gathers in the harvest. Clearly, the harvest time is determined by the Son of Man, and the reapers are the angels, not his church. So what does the story have to say to his faithful people in every time and every place? The kingdom of heaven may be compared to someone who sowed good seed in his field, but while everyone was asleep, an enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and then went away. So the first phrase I want you to notice is, while everyone was sleeping. Sleeping. It doesn't say the enemy came and sowed weeds while everyone was napping on the job. Sleeping is the normal daily habit of all people, even the most dedicated farmer. It's not that the sower had neglected some duty to the crop. Here, Jesus' story is wonderfully human, for the servants ask the question which, in one form or another, has been asked since the dawn of time, Master, did you not sow good seed? And isn't that the perennial question? Why do bad things happen to good people? 
Why do good things happen to bad people? If God is good and all-powerful, why does he let floods and famines happen? And let people suffer terrible diseases? And let babies die? The questions and the answers to those questions are endless. But they're all based on this one truly human question that Jesus puts in his story. Master, did you not sow good seed? And the response, I think, if you take an overview of the whole Bible, is that an enemy did this, not God. Perhaps the greatest example of this question in the Old Testament comes from the book of Job. God's response to Job's suffering is, were you there when I, told, when I laid the foundation of the earth? Can you tell the great seas you can come this far and no farther? Who are you to question me? And to the age-old response, did you not so good see Jesus' answer to his servants, his answer to the church, to us, is simply, an enemy did this. That's all you need to know. The servants, having not received what we would consider a satisfactory answer, just an enemy did this, having been excluded from the master's business from the beginning, and as we have already noted, being excluded from the end, the harvest, because it is the angels who do the harvesting, not the servants. The servants are left with only one thing within their realm of influence. So their question is, Master, do you want us to go and pull the weeds? The master replies, no. For in gathering the weeds, you might uproot the wheat. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the harvest time, I will tell the reapers what to do. Now there's one interesting side note about the weeds. The Greek, Greek word zizania is translated into English as a weed known as darnel. And did you know that darnel is an annual grass, and while it's green and then begins to dry, it looks very much like wheat. The servants ask, Master, should we pull up the weeds? And he says, no, lest you pull up the wheat along with the weeds. It has been explained that the wheat is the kingdom of God, and the weeds come from the enemy. And with this one little twist of the words, and the word for weeds being darnel, the weed that looks like wheat, Jesus is in effect telling the servants, the church, us, that the world is such that we cannot tell what is good and what is evil. We're not qualified. We did not know the master's plans in the beginning, we are not in control of the harvest, and at the present time, we must simply trust that the master's plan for his kingdom is greater than our inconvenience with weeds. Which brings up another interesting point. It says that the enemy planted these seeds and then went away. So if there's any more damage to be done to the field, but let's back up a minute. The master, the son of man, is confident that the harvest will come in even with the weeds. The enemy plants the weeds and then leaves, so if there is any more damage to be done to the field, to the kingdom, who's going to be doing that damage? <laughs> the evil one's power is only in planting the seeds, but the, the weeds, but the master is still confident of the harvest. So what is it that the evil one is hoping, hoping will happen? He's hoping that the servants will go in and rip up the wheat with the weeds. The evil one has no power unless we participate with him, unless we don't trust that God's kingdom will come to its harvest. The thrust of Jesus' story for his church, for us then, is not eschatological redress. That's a fancy way of saying the thrust of this story is not about God's getting even in the end but it's about the forbearance, the patience of his servants. The story is about trusting God. It's interesting that our text translated, translates it as let both of them grow. And I've seen it translated as leave both, the, both of them grow, both weeds and wheat. The word here for let them grow is the Greek word afit. Now this word shows up in the New Testament somewhere around 150 times and it is translated as let or leave approximately 40 times. The other 100 plus times, the vast majority of the time, it is translated as suffer to 
or forgive. So it's the master telling the servants, I know these weeds, they're unsightly, they're inconvenient, they're a discredit to your hard work. But for my sake, for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the kingdom, simply forgive these weeds for being, suffer these weeds to be. The story is saying to Jesus' church, to his people, to us, you can't tell the difference. You're not qualified. Let them alone. It's like he's saying, who can show me one truly good act not tainted by some other motive? Who can show me one completely good person? For everyone has something in their lives they're sorry for. If you want something to do, if you want to work in the kingdom, take a look at this field and every single day practice forgiveness. Want an example? Paul started his career killing Christians, yet over half of the New Testament is the fruit of his labor. Now this is certainly not in any way, shape, or form a call to stop trying to do good. Certainly, Christians are called to go out and help our fellow man in whatever plight he may find himself in. Financial difficulties, medical crisis, lack of stability, poverty, hunger, you name it. But in the name of goodness, we are, we are to care for all whom we confront, no matter where we find them, in a prison, in a slum, in a hospital, even in a wealthy suburb, it's not our job to judge them, but to care for them, to fill their needs, and to help wherever we possibly can. That is being Christian. That does not run contrary to this parable. It is the loving of God's field, his whole field, no matter where you find it. Suffer the weeds and the wheat to grow. Forgive them. Forgive this world for being the way it is. Caring for this world is what this story is all about. Which of you would deny a child medical attention, a roof over her head, enough to eat based on whether she was good or bad today? So yes, care for the world, but please suffer the weeds, forgive the weeds, trust in God's plan for his world. Now you know some Bible stories make me feel guilty when I read these certain stories, I always assume I'm one of the good characters, one of the good guys. But in reality, I must also assume that I am also the villain. Today's gospel lesson is just one story. In times past, this parable was always interpreted as the wheat being good people, and the weeds, the tares, being bad people. But there is another way of looking at this story. Favorite theologian of mine, Martin Bell, has this to say about today's lesson. Kingdom of God, Lord, is like so many things, yet like nothing at all that I have ever known. Perhaps my poor head will never even grasp a single strand from your many and complex images. But the story about the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds, will always be the hardest of all for me to understand. Because, at the end, the man burns the weeds. And if weeds represent people, Lord, then I know I'm guilty. The kingdom of God is like so many things. Did you mean for the wheat to represent good people, Lord? And are the weeds then desperate and evil people whose willful sins are so bound to them that there is no release? Only the fire? And is it somehow a stranger who stands responsible after all? I mean, ultimately responsible, since it is he who has sown the weeds in the first place. Is this what the story means, Lord? Is it that God created good people, and that somehow a stranger brought into being a number of bad people? And that the good people and the bad people must continue to live together side by side until the day of judgment, when they will be either rewarded or punished? God, I hope that's not what that means. Partly because I am an evil and desperate person. More because I am willfully evil and desperate. 
Heard this way, the story promises me nothing but the fire. Lord, will they, there be nothing for me but the fire? The kingdom of God is like so many things, yet like nothing at all that I have ever known. For there is no godliness in my daily walks amidst, amidst the drudgery of my life. There's only disappointment. And at that, hardly any large-scale, dramatic, or bitter letdown, there is only the simple, weary disappointment that is certainly the most disturbing byproduct of any real insight. My world disappoints me. I disappoint myself. Lord, help me understand. Could it be the very fabric of life itself that is permeated by the weeds? Dare I hope that all of humanity is represented by the wheat and that it is an explanation of the distortion of life itself that the parable is told? Is it impudent of me to wonder whether or not you are referring to the very stuff of life as having been somehow corrupted? with the corresponding result that all people find themselves living in a web of sin and of desperation and of disappointment. Is it only I, Lord? Or do all people find themselves inextricably in the grasp of meaninglessness and sin? There I hope that the weeds do not represent people, but rather alienation and despair the universal condition of all people. Have I misunderstood the parable, Lord? Or have I misunderstood the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is like so many things. I hope that the parable of the wheat and the weeds is about humanity's universal condition of sinfulness and alienation. I pray, Lord, that in the end, it will be this alienation that is destroyed and the whole of humanity that is gathered into the kingdom. If so, then there is no longer any mystery as to the identity of the stranger who sowed the weeds. There is no longer any mystery as to who nailed Jesus to the cross. It is none other than myself. On this day, I have crucified my Lord. And there comes to my awareness a new appreciation for the old saying that I am my own worst enemy. We have each of us sown the weeds, and we are all of us virtually strangled by them. And if this is what you're telling us, Lord, then burn, burn the weeds that we have sown in order that humanity might breathe. Burn the weeds and gather your children into the kingdom. I hope that's what you meant by the parable of the wheat and the weeds, Lord. I believe that's what you meant. I'm betting my life on it. 